1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we ask now that you would speak to us from this passage of Scripture. Here we're uh, learning about a church that was ignited with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they, in turn, began to let their light shine into the world. And so as we're looking now at this uh, really kind of a different subject matter here in chapter 2 as we look at Paul himself as an individual and the impact he was able to make because of his example, Lord, we pray that we'd learn of that and learn from him that we can emulate these things, these truths. So Lord, bless your word this morning and all God's people said, Amen. So again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we've entitled this book or this letter, Ignite, as we see the igniting power of the gospel. So that said, in chapter 1, we saw what a model church should be. As we come to chapter 2, we actually see what a model minister should be. And so here we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul and his example as a pastor, as a minister, as a servant. Uh, someone some time ago sent me a comical look at a church review board as they were considering certain pastors who may take the pulpit. You know, they were looking for a new pastor. And so as they considered biblical characters, here were their thoughts. After much consideration, they concluded that Adam, though he's a good man, he has problems with his wife and he's been known to walk nude in the woods. So don't know if we want him for pastor. Joseph has been accused of rape and has a prison record. Maybe not. Moses, a humble man, but a poor communicator. In fact, he left his last place of, of employment under a murder charge. So, don't know if we want him. Solomon, another great communicator, but far too many wives. Hosea, a loving, tender pastor, but his wife was involved in prostitution. John says he's a Baptist, but doesn't dress like one. <laughs> so, I don't think we're going to have him. Peter forceful leader however he's been known to say inappropriate things at the wrong time and then paul he's a fascinating preacher however he's short on tact and he's been known to preach all night <laughs> timothy too young methuselah far too old and on and on the list goes you get the idea no one's perfect no one's perfect so what does god do he uses imperfect vessels which includes myself as well as you as well as all of us he uses some of the most unlikely people. So today we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul, and he's going to be writing how he was as a minister to these people. Now here's the thing. We're looking at a minister, so you're thinking, well, it's all about you, Pastor Ron, and, and certainly this passage speaks to me. But I would remind you of what our bulletin say. On our bulletin it says, every member a minister. And you want to know why it says that? Because the word minister means, well, it comes from the Greek word diakonias, and it means servant. So guess what? We're all called to be servants. So really, this is a message that speaks to all of us. Because if you're a parent, you're certainly to minister in your home. In the workplace, if you're a Christian, you're to minister in that workplace. All the time, we are to be ministers, servants of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I've entitled our message today, A Model Minister, as Paul is going to, in the first 12 verses of this chapter, show, uh, shows really through his words how his actions were to these people, and in turn, how God wants our actions to be. So, what we're going to see in these verses is that Paul here expressed himself in three uh, general ways, and I've given you an outline to follow along. He expressed himself as a faithful steward, as a loving mother, and as a responsible father. First of all, as a faithful steward, and we're going to see this in the first six verses. And really, this comes from a term that's used down in verse 4, where he says there that we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. It's really a picture of a steward. A steward is a servant, and they were one who was over a household. They were entrusted with their master's goods, and of course, on one uh, and one day they would have to give an account of all that they were entrusted with. And of course Jesus used this analogy in many of his stories and, and parables. So Paul here in the first six verses is expressing how when he came to Thessalonica, he was a steward. He was a servant to these people. And we're going to see several things in connection with him being a steward. First of all, we're going to see that he was a dedicated man. Look at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, 
we were bold in our God to speak to you of the gospel of God in much conflict, referring to here. So this is something we've talked about before, but Paul is rehearsing how he came to this particular city and established this church. And he lets them know, I came here right after I came from the city of Philippi and established a church there. Uh, a church, by the way, that was established in much conflict. Do you remember? Paul was there with his companions, and there was Silas. He was preaching the gospel. He was beaten. He was put in stocks. He was thrown into a dungeon. And at midnight, we read that Paul and Silas were worshiping God. Thank you, God, for being beaten for you, which is hard to think of, right? But it tells us that God enjoyed that worship, so much so he brought the house down in an earthquake. And as a result, the Philippian jailer were saved, and others were saved, and a small church was started from that incredible conflict in Philippi. And so Paul had to leave Philippi, and he came now to this city in Thessalonica. And when he came here, guess what? More conflict. Talk about dedicated. That's what he's communicating here. As a steward, I've been entrusted with the gospel. I'm going to be dedicated. So he came to Philippi, and what happens? He's only here under a month, three weeks, reasoning in the synagogue. Some people get saved, but those who don't like it get upset. They hire thugs from the inner city, seeking to beat up Paul. When they couldn't find Paul, they dragged Jason, some of his companions, and, you know, there was an uprising, so much so that Paul had to flee this city, only having established it for just under a month. Yet he says, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. And that word conflict in the original language is actually an athletic term. Used to speak of someone who's, you know, at top form and totally, completely dedicated. Morning and evening, even though they go through grueling things with their body. And that's what Paul is saying here. I, I was dedicated so much so to give of myself completely to you. So Paul was dedicated to the gospel. Of course, the question we need to ask ourselves, as we've been looking at for the last few weeks, are we that dedicated? I mean, are, that, are we that dedicated? I, I realize that sometimes when it comes to sharing our faith, we are fearful, right? And we talked about that last week. But I remember of God's encouraging words to Joshua. Moses is off the scene. Joshua now is placed as the head of the whole company of three million people to take him into the promised land, a place he's never even been. That could be pretty daunting. But God says to him in Joshua 1.9, Be strong. Be of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be, don't be dismayed. Why? Because I am with you. That's encouraging. So here's Paul. Entrusted with the gospel, he was dedicated, right? Another thing we see here, as he writes about in verse 3, is that he was devoted to the truth. Man, you got to be dedicated to the gospel, but you got to be devoted to truth. He says, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. So three terms he used there in regard to truth, or the opposite of truth. He says, I didn't come to you with error, Right? Understand that the early church was under attack as the gospel begins to spread out and many are saved. So the enemy wants to sow lies to deceive people to keep them from the truth. And we have that going on today, right? All around the world. And certainly we have it happening in the United States. And I'm not talking about blatant, uh, you know, uh, other religions like Islam or Baha'i or Buddhists. I'm talking about people who cloak themselves within the body of Jesus Christ. It's rampant. And they try to deceive people with error. But Paul says, as you know, I came with no error. I spoke the truth to you. By the way, how do we as Christians know what is true and what is false? I mean, because we know that there are false people within the church. How do you know what's true or false? Well, because you have your Bible. And you're going to say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. But if you don't read your Bible, you don't know your Bible, you won't know truth from error. And you're just believing someone who's telling you something. Hey, listen... On, whenever you're hearing me say anything, you can write at the top of your notes, Acts 17, 11. Write that on there. Because it says the Bereans were more fair-minded than anybody in that they received the word of God with readiness of mind and, so they received it, but they searched the scriptures daily to see if that was so. Fine, that's great. You need to make sure that what I'm saying is right out of God's word. That's a good, be a Berean. All right. He also adds in here, it was not tainted with uncleanness. And that refers to Paul's motive. 
In Philippians 1.15, Paul talks about people that preach Christ out of strife and self-ambition. And Paul's saying, you know, when I came to you, I came with pure motives, right? Pure motives. We know that there are a lot of people in the ministry, their motive is not pure. Nor did I come with a message of deceit. In other words, I wasn't a clever salesman. I wasn't trying to get people to buy my product or trick them into the kingdom. And there are people that try to do that today. They, they try to, uh, you know, either come up with some kind of a clever argument or some kind of subtle presentation, and somehow this will trick people into being Christians. Well, that doesn't work. No, people aren't saved that way. People are saved when they hear the truth. And I truly believe that people today honestly want to hear the truth. Don't give me cotton candy. Don't give me a bunch of stuff. Just tell me the truth. I think there's, an, uh, there's a sincerity that whether they accept it or reject it, people want to know and need to hear the truth. So tell people the truth. You are a sinner. And there's a real place called hell, and you will go there unless you repent. But if you're willing to turn from sin, you can have eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have newness of life. And then you let them see that new life shining through. They say, I want that. So be honest, be sincere. Don't try to say, well, there's a place called hell. And, uh, but Jesus loves you, you know. Or be like others who never even want to talk about truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth. Be honest. Don't be deceitful. Listen, there's power in the world. Word. We, we saw that in verse 1 of chapter 5. If you look there again, Paul said, Our gospel didn't come to you in word only. It wasn't my words, but it came in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much of, uh, uh, it says assurance, but the word means conviction. Just let the word go, man. It'll do its work. So Paul was dedicated to the gospel. He was devoted to preach truth. And then also we see that he was dependent upon God being a steward. Verse 4. But as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. By the way, notice he says, I've been approved by God. Hey, Paul didn't choose the ministry. The ministry chose him. Hey, let's, let's face it. If you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, he, 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 wasn't the, he wasn't the number one choice of pretty much anybody. He even says that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he says, I was a former blasphemer. I would speak evil things against God, and I persecuted the church. Think about that. Public enemy number one, and yet God chooses him to be the church's greatest missionary and greatest writer in the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's just so awesome how God works. Because of that then, he says, I was entrusted with the gospel, and so I speak. Paul saw his calling into the ministry as a sacred trust, and indeed it is. And because of that, I so speak. I will tell people the truth, and I will do it with my dying breath. And this is what Paul told Timothy when he was giving his protege instruction. You know what he tells him? In, in 2 Timothy 4, 2, he says, preach the word, man. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, be, teach it when it's popular and when it's not. Do it everything, everything you need to do because the time's going to come when people won't want to listen to sound truth, sound doctrine. And of course, the time has arrived. We're, we're seeing that in our day and age. So Paul says, look at I, I just, I love people so much. I'm entrusted with this. I'll speak the truth. He adds in verse 4, not as pleasing men, but God who trusts the heart. I'm not trying to please men. Proverbs 29 and verse 25 says, the fear of man will bring a snare. But if you trust the Lord, you'll be safe. Don't worry about what other people think about you. Stand up and teach the truth. That's certainly true of all of us. It's certainly true of anybody who's going to be, uh, quote unquote, in a pulpit ministry. Uh, Phillips Brook was one time speaking to a group of young pastors. And he said this, quote, Courage is the indispensable requisite of any true ministry. If you're afraid of men and a slave to their opinions, then go and do something else, end quote. I would agree with that. Absolutely. In fact, listen, the ministry is so hard, at least full-time ministry. If you can do anything else, C.H. Spurgeon once said, if you can do absolutely anything else, do it. Do it. But if you can't, you are compelled and called, then you better do what God calls you to do. But here, Paul says a model minister seeks to please God, not men. He adds in verse 5, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know. It's been said that a flatterer is a manipulator, not a communicator. And that's so true. 
Because a flatterer seeks to control a person's decisions with his words for their own profit. That's, that's not being a true servant. He adds, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. If you have an NIV, it says, nor do we put on a mask to cover up our greed. My goodness, have we not seen that in the church for the last decades? People putting up lies, you know, so they can uh, get money for themselves. In 1 Timothy 6, 5, it tells us that false teachers use a form of godliness as a means of gain. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, it says, by covetousness, they exploit people, and they do it with deceptive words. So we know, when we've seen this, people putting on a mask, coming across as holy and godly, but all the while, coveting, wanting money. They name ministry, and then in the church, they name ministries out of themselves. I don't, after themselves. I, I frankly do not get that. I've got to admit, I don't get that. Such and such ministries. These people on TV and on the radio, I don't get it. They write books. There's lots of them. That is the most ridiculous thing. Please, rebuke me, come face to face and say I'm out of here. If I ever called something Ron Hint Ministries. I mean, I, I have to be honest. It has nothing to do with me. If God uses anybody in the ministry, praise God, not yourself. Right? It's just, uh, uh, just horrible. And, and the church is so used to it now, the church in general, that no one says anything. Wow. Unbelievable. Finally, he says, ultimately, the ministry, and if I'm a servant, and if you're a servant, it's all about the Lord. He says, verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men. It's not about getting glory from others, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now listen, if there was anybody who could come into town when, he, when Paul started this church in Thessalonica... It would have been Paul to give demands. After all, the gospel is now spreading across Asia Minor and Europe. And Paul's the number one guy that the Holy Spirit is using, though he's using others. And Paul has established many churches. He's writing many of the letters that we now have as books in our Bible. And if anybody could make a demand, it'd be the Apostle Paul. By the way, I'm going to be coming to Thessalonica next week. And when you have my room for me ready, I like to have M&Ms only blue. Not the green ones. And, you know, uh, soda water, Pellegrina would be perfect for me because <clears throat> yeah, my throat really nice from there. And you have to have a room that's at the Hyatt for me. That's, uh, and, you have, and, and making all these demands, that's the most ridiculous thing. By the way, there are people that do that. In the ministry, who do that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, he says, but we didn't come to seek glory for ourselves. It wasn't about us. And it never is. So Paul, we can see why Paul was a faithful steward, dedicated to the gospel, devoted to truth, dependent upon God. Those are the characters. Again, this is something that speaks to anybody that has a formal pulpit ministry, but we're all servants. These are qualities that God wants to see in us and really what the world deserves to see in us, see something different. Now, moving on, he gives a second metaphor, and we placed that in your outline, and that's of a loving mother, kind of interesting. Verse 7. But we, will ge we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. I find it fascinating that the Apostle Paul would use a feminine metaphor to describe himself yet he does so through the holy spirit of course to describe the intense love that he had for these believers it's it's like a love that a mother has for her child we we had a baby dedication in the first service and 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 you know every time i'm holding those little babies you know the mom's always looking right you're always looking and she, oh, then, you know, that, because a mom wants to be with that little baby. Now, there are two thoughts here. First of all, as Paul talks about a loving mother, like a loving mother, he gave his love. That's what moms do. They give their love. That's what Paul did. Verse 7. We were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Moms, for the most part, right, are epitomized by gentleness. There is nothing like the warm embrace of your mother when you don't feel good, right? 
Nothing like the, the, the comfort that only a mommy brings, right? I mean, the truth is the two of you could be sitting right next to one another. And by the way, this is the way it is in our home. We could both, Yanni and I could be sitting right there. And we got our two kids. And if one of them hurts themselves, who's the first person they run to? It's mommy, right? It's mommy. Oh, I'd be, oh mom, because she's all over in Lama. That's not to say that they don't love me and I don't love them, of course. But there's something about mom's love. That's why when you're on the football field and they scan the football field, all these huge guys, and who do they say? They don't say, hey, Dad, not one of them. <laughs> Hi, Mom. It's all Mom, right? It's all about Mom. Moms are gentle. And so because of that, Paul didn't burst into town when he started this church. He didn't start barking orders. This is what you need to do, and you guys need to do that. No. He was like a gentle mother. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 that a servant of the Lord, which is all of us, is not to strive but to be gentle to all men. And so just as it takes gentleness and patience and kindness to raise children, so Paul was patient and gentle and kind with this fellowship. He says, just as a nursing mother cherishes or nurtures her own children. You know, when you think about a nursing mother, and that's the analogy here of a, of a, a mother with a, an infant. A nursing mother is not demanding. A nursing mother is demanded upon. It's just the opposite, right? When her children need food, that baby needs food, she, she nurses them. She doesn't say, wait, I don't got any time right now. You're going to have to wait an hour or so. I got to clean over here. I got to do this thing. No, no. When that baby needs nourishment, the mom is right there. That baby requires her time, requires energy that she has to give out. But here's the thing. A mom, a mom, a, a nursing mom does it willingly, lovingly. She, it's what she wants to do. And so Paul is saying just as a nursing mother gives herself to her children, willingly gives her love. Paul says that's how we're to be as a servant, willingly giving. And get, think about this. That's how Paul was as a minister, as an example of a minister. But again, we're all ministers. That's the love we're to have one for another. Again, that premier passage, John 13, 35, that Jesus spoke to his disciples. And of course, speaking to us where he says, By this, all men, everyone, believers and unbelievers, are going to know you're my disciples. How? Because you have love for one another. You give your love. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Paul said these incredible words. He said, the love of Christ constrains me. In other words, all the stuff I go through, all the persecution, all the hardship, everything I do, all the times where I have to confront people, that's not easy to do, all of that is constrained and motivated out of love. I do it out of love. What a great example. So Paul gave his love. But there's a second thing as, as a, a loving mother... And that's the second thing I want you to see. He gave his life. Not only his love, his life. So verse 8, we read, so affectionately longing for you. By the way, I love that term. So affectionately longing for you. That, that describes a mom, right? She, she affectionately longs for her children. And, and I see that in my wife. I know my, my wife, Yanni, has an older son. So we have an old son, uh, Eber. He's in the military. So he's been in over a station over in Japan now for over three years. She hasn't seen her son. She wants to see him so bad, and he may not make it here for Christmas. So she is bummed, because that's what moms do, right? Those of you who are in that place, though, your moms, you want to see your kids, right? But I would say that I see that on our just dynamic right now, when, when we have two children, five and seven, and when we have to leave town for a few days, maybe it's five days or so, that we're away from the kids, she longingly wants to be back home to be with those kids. I want to call. How are they doing? I want to, I want to get a chance to go. And, and don't get me wrong, I want to see the kids. I miss them too. But I know it's not as much as her because she's talking about it all the time, right? That's how moms are. I can honestly say that as a pastor, I definitely am like that when it comes to this family. I'm like that with my immediate family. But I do say that as a pastor, I do feel that way about uh, my, our fellowship right here. And I know my wife would say that because when I have to be gone that long, I'm like, I need to get back to church. I need to be back, back there with the family. Because you feel that even as a, 
as, as a father, you want to be with the, with the congregation. But it's even more so with a mom and children. So this was Paul's heart. He says, I affectionately long for you. He adds in verse 8, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, this is what I want you to see you, but also our own lives. Not only was I giving you love, I was willing to give my own life because you'd become so dear to us. And I think this is what, what, Paul, what made Paul such a model minister. He was willing to give it all. Give it all. By the way, Again, keep in mind the analogy he's using here. He's saying this, imparting my life, in the context of a nursing mother. Now think about it. A nursing mother imparts her life to her child, right? A, a nursing mother is giving her life to that baby so that baby can take in nutrients and, and grow, right? Taking in that life-giving milk. And, and what Paul is saying is like a nursing mother, we gave you the milk of the word of God. I came into town, I was giving you the word of God, giving you the milk of the word so that you would grow. And I was willing to impart my life to see that done. Now because of that, there was fruit in the life of these people. We saw it back in chapter 1 and verse 6. We saw that these people became followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They left idols to serve the true and living God. Why? Because they saw it modeled in Paul. And now they were transformed and eventually they became models to the whole world. But it was all because of Paul's loving and giving example. Now again, we're all called to be servants, ministers. So are we living that? Are we, do people see that we're willing to impart love and impart our very lives? I mean, do our, 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 our messages, does our life match our lips? Do people see that? Because that makes a powerful impact. I mean, really to go out of the way and part your life. By the way, Paul got his example from Jesus, our supreme example. Let me, let me read to you what Jesus said about this. In Mark 4, uh, 10, 45, he said, For even the Son of Man, Jesus speaking himself, did not come to minister, to be ministered to. In other words, I did not come to be served. I did not come to be ministered to, but to minister to others, but to serve others and to give my life a ransom for many. Man, what a perfect example. So Paul, like a loving mother, imparted his love, imparted his life. So, as servants, we're to be faithful stewards, dedicated to the gospel, devoted to truth, dependent upon God. We're to be like a loving mother, giving love, giving our life. But there's a third thing here. Paul also uses the analogy of being a responsible father in verses 9 through 12. He says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. Here it is as a father does his own children. So all these things that he does here, he says, I did it just as a father does. So I have the love of a mother, but the words, the life, the charge of a father. Now, Paul often used this analogy. In fact, his protege that he was discipling Timothy, he called Timothy his son in the faith, Paul being his spiritual father. And then when Paul wrote to the Corinthians... He said these words, Though you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you only have one Father, and I have begotten you through the gospel. In other words, I'm your spiritual father because I brought you up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, Paul was a spiritual father to a lot of people. He started a lot of churches. Now, there are three things I want you to see in these verses that relate to the responsibility of a father. We're going to see his works, his walk, and his words. We see this in Paul. First of all, we see his work. As you know, a responsible father works hard, right? And all these responsible fathers in our church, you guys work hard, right? Why? I owe, I owe. It's off to work, I go. Right? That's why. A lot of work. Verse 9. He says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, laboring night and day, that we not, might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Paul here, he says, I worked hard when I came to this city of Thessalonica, as he did everywhere. 
You see, every young Jewish boy learned a trade. They were trained in a trade from the time they were a young child, even if they went on to rabbinical school, as the Apostle Paul did. So not only was he a scholar, but we also know he had a trade. And his trade was tent making. So as he journeyed in his uh, missionary endeavors, we know that he would many times support himself as a tent maker. Now, there were some churches that gave him a little bit of support. In fact, the church of Philippi was one of them that supported him while he was here in Thessalonica. We read that um, in this book, in the book of Philippi as well, or Philippians. But for the most part, Paul would work supporting himself as a tent maker by day. And tents, of course, were very needed at the time of Paul. He was a tent maker by day and a Bible teacher at night. Man, that's a lot of work. But why did he do that? Well, understand this, that Paul's calling was to establish new churches. In fact, Paul talked about in his writings about not building a foundation on someone else's work. And I'll tell you what, Paul lived that. And I love the spirit of the Apostle Paul. That's what called me to come out to Houston. I lived in Southern California where we had some great churches all around. We were practically stepping on one another. And when I felt called to go in the ministry, I said, the last place I'm going to do is be here. I thought I was going to be called to the mission field, somewhere where people need good Bible teaching. I didn't realize it, it would be here. That's why when I came here, there was no other churches in the area that were teaching the Bible verse by verse. So when other churches establish themselves right next to each other and they put churches here, I, don't, I personally do not understand that mentality. It makes absolutely no sense to me at all. My thought is, should we not be going to places where the gospel hasn't been heard? That's why I'm so mission-minded. I'm here. This is my church. This is where God has called me for life. But I can also use my energy and efforts to get the gospel to places where it's not being reached. That's important. That's why we need to be so missional for reaching the gospel with others. But this is what I preach about the Apostle Paul. He didn't set up his, his church on someone else's foundation. He was always starting new ones in new places. Now, because of that, these small little fledging fellowships couldn't support him, right? It would be difficult. By the way, if you have a New Living Translation, it translates this verse, Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that our expenses would not be a burden to anyone whereas we preach the gospel. So, I can understand what the Apostle Paul is saying because I experienced that when we established the church here. So if I go back 24 years ago, the first three, three years when, when I established this church, I was working a full-time job. I had no support. I had no one saying, hey, we'll support you. We'll do that. Neither did I ask for it and neither did I want it, to be honest with you. I wanted to let God, let's see what God can do. Don't ask anybody for money. By the way, I like that. That was me personally. I don't get people that ask for money. I personally don't. I know that even some of our missionaries ask for money. That's, I, I'm, I'm not an advocate for that, just personally, just so you know. Because I think it's more exciting to say nothing and see what God does. So that's what I did. And so I just work a job. And it took about three years. I was working 12 hours a day. And then at, I would leave about 6 a.m., come about 6 p.m. at night, and then just study during the evening for Bible study on Wednesday and Sunday. See what God does. And at first, some people came to the church and they would tithe, but all that money needed to go to expenses for the church. I didn't want to be a burden to the church because, you know, it, it becomes a burden. And it's like, why does it need to go? I can work. It was only until I could not continue pastoring the church, working at a job full time, that I came on. That was it. So I understand the heart of the Apostle Paul. He was saying, I'll do tent making during the day so I'm not a burden to a young church that, that's just so small they can't support me. That's okay, you see. Now, let's, let's make it practical for all of you because I understand. Listen, I am so blessed. Now, the church pays me a salary. I, I don't deserve it, to be honest with you. And I'm the most blessed person here. I get to do what I love to do and I get paid for it. So, I, man, I'm so blessed. Thank you. But let me also say, I realize that many of you are not called to full-time ministry. So you labor all day, you work hard on your jobs, and then you give of your time serving Jesus here. Wow. All I can say is thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. Now, let me say this. If you're not serving here, shame on you. So some of you got encouraged and some of you just got jabbed, didn't you? I'm sorry, because... You should be serving. 
I know when I was working full time and I was in a church, I served from the beginning because that's what a servant of Jesus Christ does. You serve. You should be serving where God has called you in one capacity or another. I, listen, I know families that some of them, I know someone who lives in the medical center, they stay here after second service and they're in the cleaning ministry because they can't come any other time of the week because they work in the medical center. So they'll stay after Sunday afternoon and they're part of the cleaning ministry. I know people who live in Galveston come to church here and serve. I know people who live on the other side uh, of downtown and come here and serve. They find a way to serve. Find a way to serve. There's no excuse. There, really, there is no excuse because if you want to, man, I can share some stories with you that'll blow you away of how people serve here and give of their time here and they're busy people. There's always an opportunity to find some place where you can get involved. All right, so that's another subject. But... I want to say thank you for those of you who do labor. You're working a full-time job like the Apostle Paul was, and, and you're serving. I, I've got to, I can encourage you, and you're like, well, thanks, Pastor. That's nice. But let me tell you, the best encouragement comes from Jesus himself. Hebrews 6.10 says, listen, God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you show in his name, in that you minister to the saints, that word, serve, same word, in that you serve the saints and do minister. God sees that. God will reward that. God is saying, that's my kid. Awesome. You know how you get excited this time of the year? It's right. It's now Christmas time and some of your kids are in plays. That's so awesome. That's my kid. That's what God thinks about you when you're working so hard and yet you're still serving him. He's going, man, that's my kid. He loves me. She loves me. It's awesome. So that was Paul's work. Now, Check out Paul's walk, verse 10. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly, justly, and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. So not only was Paul's work hard, his walk was right. He walked devoutly. By the way, uh, some of your translations may say holy, and that's a, good, that's a good translation there. It comes from the root word meaning holy. What he was saying is, is that my motives were pure, right? We walked devoutly. And then he says we walked justly or righteously. We walked in a right way, in a, in a just manner. We walked with integrity. And then he says we walked blamelessly. Now, understand when he says that word, it doesn't mean we were sinless. God forbid. Hey, read Romans chapter 7. Paul himself is confessing. This is Paul saying. He says the things that I don't want to do, sin, I do it. And the things that I should be doing, I don't always do. I'm a wretched man. So Paul struggled with sin, as all of us do. But here's the thing. He lived blameless. The word means above reproach. And this is God's desire for all of us, that people can look at our lives and say, there's a, there's a, there's a man, there's a woman who's living above board, a living above reproach. Does that mean perfect? No. Because you know what we do when we make mistakes? We confess it. And I'm doing that all the time, as I'm hoping you're doing that all the time. I'm doing that all the time in my home. Uh, to my wife, I'm sorry I said that. That was the wrong. I'm, forgive me. I'm saying that to my children. Somebody, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, Daddy shouldn't have been that way. I'm saying it to people at work. I'm saying it to people in the church. That, that's the way we have to be. Quick to ask for forgiveness. So that we could be above reproach. We're not talking perfection, but we're seeking to live a godly life. That was Paul. There's a great verse in Philippians 2.15. Great verse. Listen to this. He says, we should become blameless. Same word. We should become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we should shine as lights. That's the idea. We should, there should be something different about us in this crooked, perverse generation. That was Paul as a responsible father. He worked hard. He walked right. And then he, he used his words good. Check out verse 11. A as you know, how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. So he used his words. How? Well, first of all, he, he says we exhorted you. Parakalao means to come alongside to help. He says, I, there were times I came alongside to help you, to encourage you. Just like a father does his children, right? Maybe the first time one of your children does something, they see another kid do something, and then they try it, and they can't do it the first time. And they get discouraged. Oh, man, I'll never be able to do it, right? Kind of a thing. So what does a father do? Yeah, you can. You can do it. Keep trying. You're not going to get it first time. Hang in there. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's, that's encouraging. We, we do that as fathers. And then he says, we comforted you. Comfort. I'm here for you. I love you. God loves you. Man, comfort. How we need to comfort one another. 
in just this morning, just this morning, uh, prior to first service and in between first and second, talking and praying with people, I, I prayed and talked to people, four different people in our church who lost loved ones this week. Four. Four. Maybe there are others. And, and we just I say, I'm, can I pray for you? I'm sorry for your loss. Some I was aware of and I knew and I was praying for. Some I wasn't. And, and we need to comfort one another. We encourage. We comfort. But then there's also a time when a father's words need to be forceful, right? And that's really the word used here, charge. We charged every one of you as a father does his children. The, the term charge means to speak with specific orders. That's what the word means. It's kind of like a father correcting his son. Son, you did this wrong, so here's what you need to do. You need to do this, this, and this. Or here's what you need to do next time. You're giving him a specific, or her, a specific charge. That's the idea. And it's aimed at godly attitudes. It's aimed at godly actions. So Paul says, a responsible father, I worked hard, I, I walked right, I, I, I used my words to help you grow. And so here we see... In these first 11 verses, he uses three analogies. I'm a faithful steward. I'm a loving mother. I was a responsible father. And why did Paul do all of this? Why all of this? Verse 12. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In other words, my whole desire in all of this was that you grow up. That you would walk worthy. That you would live out the Christian life as God desires it for you. And that's really the goal. The goal of ministry is maturity. That's the goal. That's what every parent, what every loving mother, and whatever, what every father wants of their children, right? I mean, think about this. Do you remember the first time, those of you who had children, do you remember the first time your child walked? You thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Look at that. They're walking. They're so awesome. They're so far ahead of everybody else. I've never seen a child walk so early. They're, man, going to be an athlete, right? That's how you are. And then they start walking all over the house. You're going, I wish they wouldn't walk anymore because they're in everything. And then when they spoke for the first time, when they spoke, they said, Dad, Dad, Mama. You thought, wow, quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> Have you ever heard such elocution? I mean, listen to the way they said the dictation. Oh, wow, perfect. No. I mean, that's the way we are as parents, right? Everything's so wonderful with those little children. And that's great. But wouldn't it be tragedy if at the age of 30 or 35, they never took one walk or step out of the home. And they were still saying just mommy, daddy. That means there would be a developmental problem, right? And that happens. And that's sad. It's difficult. It's hard. Why? Because your desire as a parent is that they would grow up. That's the goal, Paul says, of ministry, that you would grow up. Do you realize that that's, that's my passion? That's my calling. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, it says, God gave the church some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. Why? For, my job as a pastor teacher is for the equipping of the saints, equipping you for the work of the ministry, for the work of servanthood. So my job is to equip you so that you grow and get it, and we all do it together. That's, that's the plan. And man, when the plan comes together, it's awesome. I agree with John, who wrote in 3 John, verse 4, he said these words, I have no greater joy than to hear my children that I've birthed in the faith walking with the Lord. I can honestly say the thing that brings me some of the greatest joy is to know that some people that I've discipled, you know, some 30 years ago and 20 years ago and 10 years ago are now ministers, full-time ministers for the gospel of Jesus Christ, or some of them are serving Jesus, or some of them are in godly marriages, and you see that, it's like, wow, that's so awesome to hear they're walking in the truth. Consequently, nothing is more discouraging than to know someone that you helped walk in the Lord, and they've walked, turned away from the Lord. They're shipwrecked. They're, that's nothing more heartbreaking. But again, we understand the goal and what Paul is saying is that my, I've done all this that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom. That's the goal. So what a great example. What a great passage. Now one last thing and we'll close up. Just this word calls in verse 12. Notice he says, we are to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own hand. He calls you. And this word calls here is actually in the present tense in the original language. It means to continue 
to call. See, what I want you to see is the call is not just a one-time call. It's a constant call. If, if you're walking with Jesus Christ, you made that commitment, and now you're serving him, it's a constant call. The call is constantly going out to go higher, to go further, to grow, to mature in the faith. It's a constant call. It's also a constant call that goes out to you if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That could be the case. You've come here today, and, and you've heard preachers talk about it, share it, but you've never at one time in your life actually heeded that call. You've heard it. It's constantly going. You've heard it many times, but you never heeded it. I pray that today, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment, that you would heed that call and embrace the love that God has for you. We talked about the love that Paul had for the church. Listen, God's love for you is perfect, full encompassing. And he, he wants you to receive that. So let's pray together right now.